Hey, good evening. Um, cool. So we are in uh, the second part of our mini series of Sound Mind, and we are talking about mental health. As Kate said, um, Matt just gave an amazing talk last week. Really recommend going and checking it out online if you weren't here to watch that. And in that talk, Matt shared really openly about his experiences um, of struggling with mental health. And also took us through the book of Job, kind of an overview of the book to to talk about how can we wrestle with the suffering and the struggles that we have. And a few things that really stood out from what Matt Matt said last week that are really helpful for us is that first, when Job is is first suffering and, and struggling, his friends come alongside him, they sit down in the dust with him, and they weep with Job. Now what that teaches us is that we need to learn what it means to weep with those who weep. We need to learn what it means to sit with those that are in pain and just be there with them. Actually, this doesn't last that long, unfortunately. Soon his friends, as the suffering is compounded, are asking the question, surely, um, surely you must have done something to deserve this punishment, Job. And Job himself starts to sort of wonder that. And then God comes in with a big booming voice at the end of the book and says, listen, I created the universe. I created this whole thing. Let me tell you what's really going on. And he sets Job straight, and because that is a complete lie. And you need to know that tonight, that if you are suffering with mental health, if you are suffering in any way, it isn't a punishment from God. And so we need to speak truth about God to ourselves, about the, the things we're struggling with, and about God. And then finally, um, as Matt finished, we learn that Job from this place of brokenness with a broken heart, came before God and was just really real and honest about how he was feeling about his suffering. And when he did that, when he came in all honesty and didn't hide from God, God replies saying, Job spoke rightly, that he did the right thing, that he was correct to come with to me and be honest and real. And that's something that we can learn, that we need to bring our suffering to God. That if you're struggling here, You need to know that God wants to be with that in you, that he is hope, he is love, he is light, and you don't have to hide that suffering from him. You can bring it to him. And one thing I think, um, so many good stuff to pick out, but one thing that's just been going around in my head from Matt's talk last week is a line that he opened with when he said, our mental health has never been under greater attack than it is today. And it's true, the statistics bear this out as well. So there's a few um, studies that have come out recently just illustrate how much of a difficult issue this, actually how much of a crisis mental health problems are in our society. So in Bristol University, in the latest wellbeing survey, they found that 45% of Bristol students screened positive for moderate to severe symptoms for depression. That's in 2019. And... Six times more young people in England have psychological problems today than in 1995. Six times more. This is a problem that has never been greater, that our mental health has never been under more attack. And so I want to look at tonight, how can we best prepare ourselves? How can we give ourselves the best chance to live and and thrive in a world where our mental health is under attack? Because actually, there are all these different things that come at us. There are all these different uh, factors that we face that make it harder and harder for us to have positive, good mental health. And I was trying to think about um, what this feels like, what that feeling of, of living in a world that is quite difficult to protect our mental health is like. And it reminded me of a time uh, when I was 16 years old, and me and my brother were going to the hospital uh, for a checkup, um, check that our hearts were working fine, just like we had to do. Normally, it's like uh, the thing that goes around your arm, and it pumps, and your arm goes dead and weird, and, or a little stethoscope on the chest, check that your heart's still beating, good, all good. Um, but this time, it was a little bit different. We walked into the hospital, and the nurse showed us the two treadmills, stood by, side by side, and she said, right, today, we're just going to ask you, to run and keep on running until you can't run anymore. No, no biggie. We want to test how much your heart can take. Now, for me today, 25-year-old Sam, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm giving it 90 seconds max, and then I'm hopping back off that treadmill. I don't need that trouble in my life. I don't need to know how much my heart can take. But back then, I'm 15, 16 years old. There is testosterone pumping through my body. I'm incredibly competitive. And this, 
We've just been offered, me and my brother, a chance to scientifically prove once and for all who is the greater athlete out of the Cook brothers. Let me tell you, with that on offer, there was no chance that Joe was going to run on that treadmill longer than me. So we got on the treadmill and we just start running. And it's easy to start with, right? You know, when you're in the gym, it's just an easy, easy start. I look over at Joe, he's doing well. And then the nurse says, okay. Now we're just going to pick the speed up a bit. And you're like, okay, now we're running. And I, I'm not ideal. I'm in my school uniform, so blazer comes off. Ty goes around the head for a sweatband. And the nurse says, okay, now we're going to increase the speed a bit. So now we're really running. I look over at Joe, and he seems to be doing okay. And I don't really know how, because I'm starting to sweat. He says, okay, we're going to increase the speed a little bit. And now we're really running. Now like, this is a proper sprint. He says, okay, now we're going to add some incline. And so we're running incline. Now I'm kind of running up a hill. It's more incline. Now we're going more incline. It's like Marlborough Hill running up the hill. And Joe seems to be doing fine, more speed, more speed, and I'm running really fast, more incline, more incline, and eventually I have to stop and jump off because my heart's about to give out, a bit like it is now, and I'm trying to run and run and run and try and keep up, trying to beat Joe because I've got to prove that I'm better than him at this, I've got to prove my heart's bigger than his, and I'm running and I'm running and the nurse is just putting more, more incline, more speed, more incline, more speed, and actually that's what it's like for us today living in 2020. We live in a world that says, you think you're doing okay? More speed. Here we go again. You're a university student, and you're doing fine. And then it comes around, and May is coming. Exams are coming, and you've got to be in that library long hours. And it's more speed. You're in the office on a Friday night, and the boss says, I need you to come in tomorrow morning. I know it's a Saturday, but I need you to come in anyway. More speed. You're working night shifts. You're doing four in a row, and you can't sleep, and your sleep is all over the place. More speed. You're a teacher trying to do the marking, trying to do the lesson prep. More speed. And you wake up in the morning, and the first thing you do is you check Instagram. And you don't know why, but you're kind of addicted to it, and you're just instantly comparing yourself to everyone else. It's like more inclined. You can't pay your bills. You're way into your overdraft, but you still buy stuff on ASOS. It's more inclined. More, more, more. We live in a world that tells you you've got to keep on going. You've got to keep pushing more and more and more. And the truth is, either we jump off or we're going to get hurt. If we keep on running, keep on trying to keep on, we're going to get hurt. And that's what we see around us today. And, and you may be here and you say, actually, I don't really do the church thing. I'm just here to check out what Christians say about mental health. And no matter where you're from, what faith background, what you believe, we can all agree on this, right? That this wasn't, isn't the way it's meant to be. That surely we weren't meant to see these levels of, of struggling around our mental health. Surely the world isn't meant to be 24 hours a day, go harder, go more, go faster. Surely there's meant to be another way. And the good news is that there is a bunch of resources, things we can do available to us to help us navigate life in 2020. But when the world tells us to go faster and harder and faster and harder, there are things available. And I just want to back what Matt said last week up, that we need to take full advantage of uh, the stuff that's available to us. Just because we're Christians does not mean we don't see our GP, get the prescriptions, go find counseling, take advantage of any services we have. There are all these different things we can do. But there is one thing that I want to focus on that the Bible gives us, and a principle that's thousands of years old that I believe can be incredibly helpful. Now, hear me clearly. This is not a, um, an, in, an online advert that says, like, you'll never believe this one quick trick. Doctors don't want you to know. This isn't that at all. This isn't a, a simple solution that's going to make it all go away. But it is a really, really helpful principle. And what's amazing is people have been practicing this for thousands and thousands of years, and yet I don't think it's ever been more relevant than it is today. And so we read about it uh, first in the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible. And just a bit of context uh, before we dive into that. Um, the people that we're focusing on, the Israelite people who the Old Testament kind of focuses on, they've been in slavery in Egypt for hundreds of years up to this point. Um, Moses comes along, uh, he free, you know, you've got the plagues, the, um, the blood in the Nile, then it's like Moses' staff, there will be miracles when you believe, through the Red Sea, out to the other side, into freedom, they're in, now they're, they've escaped from, the free, uh, from slavery and they're in freedom, um, the other side. And as they get out of slavery, Moses is given by God this, these rules, this law to live by. And it's like this, this new law that says, 
If you follow these things, this is how to live as a free nation. You've been living as people in slavery for years. Now follow these rules to understand what it means to live as a free people. And we know a bunch of these, even if you haven't been around church much before. You, you'll know a few of them, just heard of them. The first ones that he starts off with are the Ten Commandments, the big ones. And the bit that we're going to read from is right in the middle of it. We find in Exodus 20, it says this. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. Moses says, remember the Sabbath day. This is a commandment. And that's the word Sabbath day. Um, the Hebrew Sabbat, it means to stop. It means to, to stop, to pause, to in, imagine when I'm running on that treadmill, all I can look at as I'm running is the plug that the treadmill's plugged into, thinking, will someone please unplug this treadmill, unplug it, make it stop. That's what Sabbat is. It's this idea of, of stopping from working, from trying to impress people, from uh, trying to be productive. All the stresses and strains we have in life, it's a, it's a stop. And so um, for the people of, uh, of Israel, and actually for us today, I believe, this is a, a, a command to think about a 24-hour period where we too can stop from all the stresses of life, of having to work. But we can also apply this in other ways as well, this idea of sabbat, of stopping. It might be that for you right now, you need to stop with the social media. That that is actually making your mental health uh, problems go into overdrive, and you need to stop. It might be that you need to stop... Um, buying so much stuff to try and keep up all the time that you're engaged in kind of consumerism culture so much and it's bad for your mental health. Whatever it is, we need to talk about what it means to unplug. And I know um, if you're like me, you probably think this is kind of, there's the Ten Commandments, right? Some of them are big, some of them are, are you know, the classics. Do not kill, big one. Do not commit adultery. Do not cover your neighbor's oxen. I know Luke Chan's struggling with that, so if someone could just help him out afterwards, a bit of prayer. And we all know, actually, they, they're pretty self-explanatory. You don't have to worry too much um, about, you know, they don't need much explaining. Don't kill someone. Okay, I get it. Don't cover your neighbor's oxen. Okay, I won't. Easy. But this one, if we're honest with you, sometimes it's like it's, there's the nine commandments, and then there's like the tenth one in the middle that... We could do it if we want, if you like bonus points, it's like the extra level at the end, but don't want, just skip by it if you're not up for it. But interestingly, this is the commandment where we get an explanation of why we should follow it. It's almost as if Moses knew that we weren't probably going to pay attention to it that closely. And so he gives us a reason to follow this commandment to stop. And we read it straight away afterwards, it says this. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So Moses, in an attempt to, to help his people understand why they should stop, why they should unplug, refers to creation. And he says, the Lord made the earth in six days. Now, um, whatever your interpretation of the creation story, um, the six time periods, that sort of thing, it's the principle that still applies to us. That the God made the earth in this six rhythm and then rested in one. There's a rhythm of six days of working and one day of rest. And that's a template for us to follow, but it's also something that is baked into creation. That when God created us and created the universe, he created in it this kind of this need, this desire, this, this drive to not just keep on going all the time. This rhythm of six days of being productive. And one day we say, okay, enough. I'll stop. I'll rest. I'll jump off the treadmill. I'll unplug. When it comes to this command to, to stop, we need to understand that it is part of who we are created to be. We are designed to unplug. It's part of the creation of the universe, and as we're created as humans, it's within us, this, this desire to say, I can't keep on going all the time. I need to, after six days of working, take that day where I can stop. Now, you may not believe me um, that this is kind of 
uh, a part of creation. But I do believe there is some evidence that we can turn to that, um, that can support my claim. So first of all, uh, we have God creating the six day, seven days. There we go. Monday, Tuesday. Probably not those days, but ignore that. And on the seventh day, he rested. Now, we see this here. We also see this in some of the great works of literature, um, some of the classics of our time. We see this rhythm of six days of working and one day of resting in the very hungry caterpillar. So on Monday, he ate one apple. On Tuesday, he ate two pears. On Wednesday, he ate three plums. He ate four strawberries on Thursday. On Friday, he ate five oranges. On Saturday, he ate one piece of chocolate cake, one ice cream cone, one pickle, one slice of Swiss cheese, one slice of salami, one lollipop, one piece of cherry pie, one sausage, one cupcake, and one slice of watermelon. And then on Sunday, he rested. It's not just in a literature some of the great works of literature, we see this. We also see it in music. Um, so an icon of mine um, and a lyrical genius. Um, we see it in Craig David. <laughs> he said he, he got a number on Monday. He took her for a drink on Tuesday. And then obviously somewhere between Tuesday and Wednesday, they got married because they then uh, made love on Wednesday. On Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and understandably, they then chilled on Sunday. It is baked into us, into creation, from the hungry caterpillar, Craig David, to Genesis. I know I'm joking, but genuinely, I believe that this is something that goes beyond the great works of art, and actually is true for us today. That we know when we try and keep on going and keep on going, keep on pushing and working, something just goes wrong. I don't think it's surprising that so many of us struggle with our mental health because we're told that you just keep on going. And it's ignoring the way that we were designed. It's ignoring the way that we were created. It's going against the flow in which we were created. And it's no wonder that we feel the harm. Now, you may be uh, saying, well, you know, that's, that's all well and good for you. Um, you know, you, you, you work for the church. Out there in the real world, there's deadlines and there is, you know, bosses breathing down our necks. You haven't met Philip Gennardo, clearly. And there is, uh, and there is, there is thing, projects that we've got to do and it's work, work, work. And it's true that, um, that the world around us does give us this illusion of working, 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 of keeping on going. Actually, the longer you work, the better. The harder you work, the better. It's the Elon Musk fallacy of the 100-hour week, that you just keep on going. And the truth is that it, that is just a fallacy. That If you want to work better, it means taking rest. And we see it in uh, some studies, some pretty major studies from places like the Harvard Review and Ernst & Young, that people are starting to catch up with this idea that we can't just keep on going. So for every additional 10 hours of holiday, employees took, in they, <laughs> this, is from, no, this is from the Ernst & Young, kind of a big internal review they did. And they said for every, addition, every additional 10 hours of holiday, employees took their year-end performance ratings improved by 8%. That those guys that took the extra holiday were found to be performing better. There's another study that the Harvard Review talks about, which said that bosses could not distinguish between employees who actually worked 80 hour weeks and those who just claimed to work 80 hours a week but actually worked much less. That those that actually worked 80 hours weeks weren't actually being any more productive than the guys who just pretended to. Their bosses couldn't tell a difference. It's this fallacy that we work more and more and more and more because that's what it takes to make it in the world. But the truth is that we work best when we rest. I found that to be true for myself. So in a second year of university, I remember making a decision that I was going to take a day off every week where I didn't go to uni, which a uni is like, we don't work that hard every day, but we do work every day. That's the culture. And I remember deciding I'm not going to do that. And this isn't going to happen for all of you. Um, I've got to put the disclaimer in. This isn't a Sam Cooke guarantee. But my grades actually went up 10% from the day that I decided I was going to take a day off each week. I ended up doing two a week because I was just loving it. I thought I'd do 20% instead. <laughs> Didn't work. Um, six and one. But um, the truth is that I was more 
I was enjoying my rest, and it meant that when it came to work, I was more productive, I was more focused. I could keep going. I knew that there was a rest coming at the end of the week. We work best when we rest. You may say that actually isn't this, isn't this kind of quite a religious idea? Isn't this kind of these laws and these, these tough practices, aren't they? Isn't this the sort of thing that Jesus came to abolish? Jesus, he, he was against religion. He was against these tight laws that said, you've got to do this on this day. Didn't he come to get rid of all of that? But actually, we know Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for man, that the Sabbath is, is a tool for man so that they can live their best lives, so they can flourish, so they can be everything they're meant to be. And Jesus also told us time and again that he wants what's best for us, that he wants us to experience real rest. We read his words in Matthew when he says this. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't let anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely. And lightly. We are designed to unplug. It's how we live a healthiest life. It's how we make sure that we can protect ourselves as much as possible from struggling with mental health. It's actually how we make the best employees, the best uni students. And you may say, well, that's a really nice idea that we, could, uh, that we were created in this way. But it's completely unreasonable when you then put that in the context of 2020 Bristol, of the pressures of work life, of the 24-hour life, of the phone that's always on, of social media. And actually, what's amazing is I think Moses also speaks straight into this situation. So, so interesting. The Bible has this ability to speak directly into our lives today. So later on, um, a generation passes. Moses is now an old man. Um, the Israelites have been wandering around in the desert for uh, quite a while. and quite, The people that came out of slavery, quite a lot of them had died off. And Moses is about to too. And so he sits down as one of his last acts and he tells the people of Israel the laws that, he had, that we read earlier. He does a repeat. He says, okay, I'm going to remind you one more time. And once again, in the middle of the Ten Commandments, we find this, this commandment to stop, to unplug. This is in Deuteronomy this time. It says this, Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. When we see this, Moses is kind of he's giving us the same uh, law that he gave us last time. But this time, a generation on, he gives a different explanation of why we need to unplug. He says this, Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. And that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Moses says you need to remember that as a people, we were in slavery. Now, what that looks like for the people of Israel when they're in slavery is that they are a commodity to be bought and sold. That their value comes in how many bricks they can produce. That their worth is found in, am I working hard enough for Pharaoh? Am I working hard enough to produce more and more and more for Egypt? And so throughout centuries of slavery, the Israelite people developed this slavery mindset that says that my value comes in how much I can produce, of how hard I can work. And Moses has taken them out of slavery But he realizes here that that it's one thing to take the people of Israel out of slavery, but it's another thing to take the mindset of slavery out of the people of Israel. 
that deep in there is still this idea within them that I need to keep on working, that I need to keep on producing, that I need to keep on going because that's what I'm worth. I'm worth how productive I can be, how many bricks I can produce. And so he says, it's not enough just for you to know that you're no longer slaves. I need you to practice this. I need you to put this into action. I need you to commit to say that on the seventh day, we won't work because we do not live in slavery anymore. We do not need to work every day to prove our worth. The world is going to keep on spinning if I stop. And that is a challenge for us today as well. So many of us, we may say that we live in freedom, but actually we have that same slavery mindset. It's not that we're saying our value comes in how many bricks we produce, our value comes in how many likes we get. It's not that our value comes in how hard we work, our value comes in how many hours of overtime we can clock in. It's not that our value comes in how good a slave we are. Our value comes in what grades we get. We are so often putting our value into those things of Egypt, of slavery, that says you are only worth what you produce. You are only worth the grades you get. You are only worth how much you can impress people. And so Moses says you need to take the Sabbath day. You need to draw a line in the sand. You need to say, I am going to rest. I'm going to break. I'm going to unplug from the system that tells me that this is what I'm worth. Because we are designed to unplug, but we also unplug to defy. That when we unplug and we step back and we say, enough, I'm stopping. I don't need to work every minute of every day. I don't need to prove anything to anyone. It's not just a weak act that says, I'm not strong enough to work every day. I'm not like those other guys that can do that. It's an act of strength. It's an act of defiance. It's an act of saying that my value doesn't come in how much I can produce and how hard I work. My, act, my value comes in being a child of God. This is an act of defying against a system that tells you you aren't worth anything. And so for us, this is a huge challenge. Will we defy against social media age that says you are only worth how many selfies you post, you are only worth how much you stay engaged? Are we able to unplug, to not look at our phones for 24 hours or whatever it is? Are we able to step back and and take a break from Instagram to say, I don't need to find my value in that anymore? Are we able to unplug and, and say, I don't need to have my work email on my phone when I'm at home because I don't need to be on all of the time? Because I don't need to, my value doesn't come from being the employee that you can always reach at a moment's notice. My value comes from being a child of God, and so I can break and I can stop. When we observe this Sabbath, when we say that we are going to unplug, that we're going to stop, that we are enough, we are saying, I don't need to earn more money to find my value. I don't need to climb the career ladder to find my value. I don't need the bigger house, the bigger car, the more expensive holidays. I don't need to impress people on social media. I need to show the world outside this is what I look like when I really filter myself because that's not where I find my value. I don't need to be buying clothes off ASOS every day. I don't need to be on Amazon all the time buying more and more stuff to keep up with those people around me because I don't find my value in being part of that slavery mindset. I am able to defy. I'm able to set myself free and say I am enough just to stop and rest because I am a child of God. It's no wonder we have a mental health crisis in our universities. Because we tell students time and time again, your value comes in getting that 2-1 to get that grad scheme to get that job. Your value comes in clocking in the hours in the library. It's no wonder suicide rates in men in their 30s are incredibly high. Because we tell them that your value comes in climbing that career ladder and keep on climbing the career ladder. And then at some point, you'll reach a point where you feel valued and it's a lie. The value doesn't come in getting that next promotion or earning more money. It comes in being a child of God. It's no wonder that we have uh, anxiety issues for young women. It's no wonder that so many young women struggle with body dysmorphia. Because they are plugged in all the time into a world that tells them, this is what you have to look like. And if you don't, you are of no value. And so when we say, I don't need to do that, when we say, I'm going to unplug, 
We're defying that system. It's a stand against a world that is causing a mental health crisis. Now, maybe that sounds a little bit like, when I talk about this stuff, it can sound a little bit like I'm proposing that we all go Amish and we all go hide in the corner and just sit in the dark for one day a week and you're not allowed to do any of the things that you like and you're definitely not allowed to touch your phone. This isn't what I'm proposing at all. In fact, just to give you an example, um, my, uh, the day that I try and take off is Wednesdays because I work, most weekends work for the church. Um, and so on a Wednesday, I wake up and... I just have a great breakfast. I've been experimenting with like corn tortillas, avocado and eggs lately. Lovely, great breakfast, Tabasco sauce. I go to the cinema with my brother, Meerkat Movies. It's Champions League at the moment, Wednesday night's Champions League. I'll go to a coffee shop. I'll read a really good book. I just try and do things that make my soul really happy where I'm not trying to impress people, where I'm not trying to work, where I don't have to be productive. I can just enjoy life. And I love it. It's my favorite day of the week. And actually, there's some, there's some really helpful things that we as a community can try. And so um, there's a few kind of tips, steps up here that, that might be helpful for you to try to unplug. The first one is to have an unplugged day. Could you leave your phone in the cupboard or by your bedside table or whatever for a day? Or just for the afternoon when you go out for a walk? Do you really need your phone when you're going out for a walk? The photos aren't going to be that good. It will make a world of difference, I promise you. Can you get an alarm clock? This is on a similar note. I don't want to think about the damage that it's doing to our mental health for the first thing we see in the morning and the last thing we see at night is social media and the world of comparison. But the excuse for many of us is that it's my alarm clock. I need it by my bed. Well, you can buy an alarm clock. I've got one, and it makes a huge difference. And I sleep better as well. It's a win-win. Could you practice a weekly Sabbath? Could you say, um, I'm going to choose a day each week, maybe a 24-hour period where I'm going to stop, where I'm going to observe the, that one of the Ten Commandments and, and just rest and just enjoy? Could you go for a no-phone work email that you just delete the work email from your phone? Because you just don't need it. It's just not helping our mental health at all. And finally, could you take a shopping detox? If we live in a society that tells us you have to keep on getting more and more and more, could you go a month without shopping at Amazon or ASOS? Can we detox from that wider environment? Can we stop? Something amazing happens when we do this. And this is why I think this is so important for our mental health. This is why I think this is such a key principle for 2020. Because when we unplug, when we step back, jump off the treadmill, pull the plug out, something happens, it certainly happens to me, that over time, I begin to be able to plug back in to the things that I actually really care about. So one example is, you can plug back in to yourself. Now, on a day off, I am... Um, Something weird will happen. Honestly, this is so odd. Like, a few hours in, I'll start to have feelings, emotions. Weird, isn't it? I just, I start to like, because I've been running really hard on the treadmill of life all week and just going and going. And when you're going full stop, you just kind of push everything down, right? You just sort of say, okay, I'll deal with that when I've got more time. Not right now. I'm working. I'm working. I'm in the library. I'm in, in the office. I'm working. When we're on our social media all the time, it's really hard to listen to the stuff that's really going on inside. And so sometimes when I unplug, what I discover is there are all these feelings that I didn't know that I need to work out. Ah, oh, when that person said that the other day, it actually, actually kind of hurt me. Or actually, I was really disappointed by that thing that happened. This is so important for our mental health because the effect of us just keeping on going and pushing down those feelings with noise and noise and noise means we can never work through that stuff that's really happening inside us. We need to plug in to ourselves. When we unplug from the world around us a little bit, we find that we can plug into real community. There is a shallow community on Instagram, on Facebook, on social media. But when we unplug from that, even just for a while, it means that we can plug into deep community. 
This is so important for our mental health because I know that so many people struggling with mental health, it's a feeling of loneliness and isolation. You feel like you're, you're the only person in the world that feels like this. We need real community. Matt spoke last week about having those friendships that you can be real and honest, that you can just bear it all with. It's hard to have those if we're plugged in all the time. I want to suggest if you're part of this church, if you say, yeah, I'm part of Metro, I want to challenge you to really commit to a hub. And it might be for your um, mental health. It might be that you know you need that support network. But it might be that actually you are the support network for someone else. And there's someone else that is having a really tough week and they feel lonely and isolated. And all they need to know is that if they turn up tonight on a Tuesday evening that you're going to be there. When we're not committed, when we're plugged into other things, when we're in the office at 9 o'clock on a Tuesday evening, in the library late in the evening, instead of being plugged into those deep communities, we can't support each other through those mental health challenges. And finally, when we unplug, when we step back from a bit of the business of life, we find that we can plug into Jesus and our relationship with him. This is huge. This is so, so significant. If you're here and you're um, not a Christian and you're just sort of coming along to see what this is all about, you need to know that in Jesus we find hope, we find life. There's freedom for you. Jesus loves you. But it's really hard to know that when we're surrounded by so much noise. It's really hard to hear Jesus whispering that he loves you when we're surrounded by so much noise. When we unplug, I find personally it's so much easier for me to have that life-sustaining relationship with Jesus. If you're here and you're a Christian, you say, yeah, I I say I I follow Jesus. We need to think clearly and carefully about are we going to follow one of those Ten Commandments? Because Jesus has given us a way to live freely, lightly, a way that is sustainable, a way that actually can fight back against some of the mental health challenges that we struggle with in our community. Are we going to take this call seriously? When we unplug a little from the world, when we jump off that treadmill just for a moment, we find that we can really plug into the stuff that really matters. Our big idea this week is this, that as the world tells us to keep going harder and faster, the Bible tells us to unplug. As we practice the Sabbath, we find space to plug into the things that protect our mental health. Now, we're going to, we've got some cards um, that the team are going to come around and hand out. And these have just got some little practical uh, tips on them of how it might be, look like for you to unplug um, and a few ways in which you can plug into that deeper stuff that supports good mental health. Take one, take a few if you want to take one for your friend, put it in your wallet. It's just a little reminder because actually, if we're going to do this stuff, we need to commit to doing it. But as those are coming around, I want to read to us again um, that passage that we read in Matthew earlier. As I said, I believe that in Jesus we find hope, we find life. And so we're going to spend a little moment as I read this passage just in silence. And we're just going to let some of that anxiety and, and stuff that's been building up as we run and run and run. We're just going to bring that to Jesus. So why don't you stand with me? Um, The band are going to come on up. I'm going to read that passage again from Matthew. And just as I do, just let the words that he says be true for you. You might want to close your eyes. You might just want to spend a moment in silence. You might want to be ready to receive from him. It says this, the words of Jesus. Are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Let's just take a moment in silence just to let some of those anxieties and that weight Just go.